pathogens, for example, these are bacteria that cause sicknesses and the like, uh, when they become pathogenic, is this because they have developed new genes, have undergone evolutionary change, or what makes them a pathogen in the first place? Well, like any organism that re reproduces sexually, they can actually transfer genetic material from one organism to another. It's called a plasmid, a small fragment of DNA which the bacterial cells have, which is packed and then transferred to a recipient from a donor, spliced into the DNA with very precise enzymatic activity, and then the creature has now acquired immunity or resistance to pesticides or herbicides or antibiotics, but there's no new genetic material. It's just transferred genetic material. It's just like every human being we see on this planet looks slightly different from their ancestors because the material has been repackaged. But it's a very precise process. So no new material, and all this acquired immunity doesn't make them evolutionary products, but just reconstrued organisms. Now, how is all of this possible? Well, there's a new science in the world which has taken the world by storm. It's the science of epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is a fascinating science. Because people came to the conclusion that it's not only hardcore genetic material that is transferred from one generation to another, but even diseases can be transferred from one generation to another, which are not built into the hardware of the genetic material, or behavioral patterns, or mental patterns can be transferred. And the reason why this happens is because genes are marked. They're wrapped around proteins called histones, and then genes can be marked for activity or for deactivation by methylating the genes. So a gene that is tightly wrapped around one of these histones will not be active, will not be read. So let's say that this gene that is tightly wrapped around this histone is a gene that functions in the development of legs. If it's tightly wrapped around there, it will not give the necessary information to develop those legs. If it's not so tightly wrapped, it might be partly activated and you can get rudimentary legs. If it's totally open, then it will be red and act normally. So this new science is absolutely fascinating because you can have rapid changes in structure, in appearance, in one generation. And scientists would say, well, this would take millions of years to develop this, but just by this process, you get it in one generation. So it's not evolution. And uh, seeing that you can transfer character traits, it becomes even more fascinating, because generally when, when reproduction takes place, most of the genes are set back to the zero state, but some of them actually aren't. So eating habits, for example, can be transferred from one generation to another. Nervous dispositions can be transferred from one generation to another. Uh, the way your hormones act, whether you are an aggressive person or whether you are a mild person, can be transferred from one generation to another. This is a new deal which nobody suspected before. And if you rigorously change your habits from your predecessors, you can actually stop the genetic marking and change the situation. But it can still take a few generations to get it out of the blueprint. Now, isn't it interesting that the Bible says character traits are carried forth to the third and fourth generation? Just an interesting point. So is this something that could explain it? Epigenetics, a turning point in our understanding of heredity. There is increasing evidence that epigenetic modifications are transgenerational. They go from one generation to the other. 
inherited through multiple generations in a variety of species. Ex examples, coat color in mammals, eye color in uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly that they have investigated, symmetry in flowers, longevity. The same absolute identical genetic material with different implantation can make one organism live twice as long, can make a creature twice the size as the other one in one generation. So this puts a totally new spin on the paradigm. So for example, the difference in coat color in these two genetically identical mice is due to epigenetic modification. Now, Darwin knew nothing about genes, and he certainly knew nothing about epigenetics. Epigenetics, epigenetics can be explained in terms of software. The genes represent the hardware, and the epigenes represent the software which govern how the hardware is going to be used. Now everybody knows that a computer has the same hardware as the next computer, but depending on the software you can either design buildings and be architecturally inclined, or you can be a poet, depending on what software you use. So the hardware is programmable and usable in thousands of different ways, which puts a total new spin on variability. Now, if you look at bees, for example, they're rather fascinating, because in bees you have a colony and you have all these sterile workers and you have one reproductive entity which is called the queen, and she produces all the eggs for the colony. Now, the interesting thing is, if the queen should die, then the workers could change their diet, some of them, and partake of the royal jelly. And when they do that, they actually start changing and becoming queens. So my question is, does a little worker bee have all the genes it takes to be a queen? Obviously, otherwise they couldn't change. Now what is the marker that makes the difference? The difference in diet. Here's another question. Can the diet that you partake in have dramatic effects on your anatomy, yes or no? Obviously, because the whole anatomy of the little worker changes and it becomes a big fat egg-laying queen. So what you eat can activate certain markers and change uh, conditions in the same way environmental markers can change an organism. Now, this is not evolution. This is a complex structure that is so intricate and needs such precision that it smacks of design. The changes that take place do not have to take place over millions of years because you can go from giant to small in one generation, from one color to another, different structures developing very rapidly by epigenetic mechanisms. So if I look at the world today, I can put on Darwin's glasses and look at them and all the creatures and say, oh, I don't see beneficence on all sides. I see death and destruction and parasites. Therefore, evolution is correct. Nothing else works. But I could look at the world and I could look at this beauty and the symmetry in the flowers. And I could look at the variety and the colors. And I come to the conclusion, there's no need for beauty and symmetry in order to reproduce. Do you have to be beautiful in order to reproduce? Does a dog, such as an Afghan hound with its long blonde hair, care what the mutt looks like that he wants to reproduce with? Doesn't care. It's a hormonal action. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be beautiful. So why, why do we need beauty? Why do we need it? Why do birds display these beautiful colors, their secondary sex characteristics? Is the male attracting all the attention to himself? Or was there another reason why they were so pretty? If you look at the sacred ibis, it's a beautiful bird, beautiful colors, but it's related to the bald ibis, which is anything but beautiful. And the difference between the two, very closely related, Differences in habitat, differences in diet, epigenetic changes, very rapid. It doesn't take millions of years. And by the way, they can interbreed and the offspring is sort of half pretty, half ugly. 
So this doesn't take millions of years to develop. Or if you look at these beautiful birds with their different colors and their different attitudes, isn't this to gratify the eye of the beholder or the delicacy of some of these creatures and the mild, gentle habits as to the more excitable, squawky habits? Variety is the spice of life, the smacks of design. And weren't we supposed to interact and have relationships with these creatures? If you look at these flowers and the beauty that is written all over them, or these, or the magic of a sunset, is it just conjecture that there is a designer?